Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's a real pleasure to welcome you to the CELS lunchtime seminar today. I've got the great honor and privilege to introduce you uh, to you, Henry Devala, um, who um, is a man of many parts, um, but he um, is a professor at both Nijmegen and Antwerp, which he pronounces far better than I do. Um, I've had the pleasure of knowing Henry for some time. And indeed, just before we went live, we were reminiscing of the fact that the last time we met in person um, was at a, a lovely conference in Trento in the snow. But we are also reminiscing of the fact that we both got rather ill afterwards. So we fear that um, this may have been um, uh, that we, we were affected by COVID before we knew it was COVID and how, it, how, how serious it's, been, it's become. So I want to um, give the floor to Henry and he's going to talk for 30, 35 minutes or so and then we'll take questions. If you could be so kind as to put the questions in the Q&A box um, and then I will ask them to him um, in, uh, once he's finished talking. So Henry, thank you so much for joining us today. It's a real honor and privilege. The floor is yours. Thank you uh, so much, Catherine. I'll start sharing my screen in a moment, but um, maybe afterwards we can continue the blame game indeed as to uh, who uh, gave the virus uh, to whom. <laughs> um, but in the meanwhile, let me also say indeed, it's a tremendous pleasure to, to be here. And it's a terrific honor to uh, give a paper in this um, prestigious series. Um, it's obviously a pity that we have to do it um, online uh, today. Um, I do fondly remember the last time we met in beautiful Trento in the north of Italy um, less than two years ago. And it almost feels now a bit as if we were on a different planet back then. Mm -hmm. if you just uh, keep in mind the UK was still in the EU. Those were the days. Um, Corona was still mainly known as a Spanish beer brand. Um, and I think, uh, well, Zoom was a noise which either a bee would make or the noise which your old television set would make uh, just before it was about to break down. Um, so that's all in a distant past. Um, the past, as you say, in the UK is indeed another country. And we did many things differently there, including um, academic seminars. Um, nevertheless, I'm thrilled to be here um, with you. And I uh, prepared my slides, which should come up properly right now. Um, so um, the past will feature um, as well in my talk and particularly where it concerns the life and times of the European Court of Justice. As much may be clear already from the subtitle um, you see here. Um, the main title is wherefore by their fruits ye shall know them from the King, King James Bible, um, those well-versed in scripture, we'll have spotted the reference um, already to the gospel of uh, Matthew, the parable um, of um, the tree, um, or even some lines also in the gospel of Luke um, with regard to the distinction of uh, the good prophets from, um, from the bad ones. The main intention of my paper is to interrogate the notions of success and failure. And hereby place under scrutiny a number of features which I must say are perhaps a majority background features which reveal something, um, something which you might refer to as the maybe the 40 shades of gray um, or perhaps even the, the shades of outright darkness, as far as that makes sense, in the evolution of this judiciary. So in the lives and times, life and times of the European Court of Justice. Um, now as a preliminary caveat, maybe um, good to underline, the idea is constructive. Um, so what I do not mean to do is to provide ammunition to those with, um, let's say, a wholesale allergy against the Court of Justice um, and against all things European integration. So the haters or um, the skeptics, as far as present in the cell series anyway, um, they may best look elsewhere. Plenty of other seminars to take part in uh, today. Um, so my intention is to offer a nuanced assessment. Um, and we'll be looking at uh, a couple of elements which may have all too often been swept under the rug. Um, and well, still regularly, they end up there somewhere under um, the carpet. When we look at the achievements of the Court of Justice, then we can definitely see many. And 
I think also any serious EU law scholar has to own up to the fact that the development of this institution um, has been by and large a success story. I think little to be argued uh, with regard to that particular conclusion. Um, and well, um, if we then look at the development of this institution all the way back to the 1950s, when the court was still tucked away in the humble Villa Vauban, which is nowadays a, a fancy restaurant in uh, Luxembourg, um, well, all the way from those early 1950s up to the grand edifice, which we nowadays find in Luxembourg on the Plateau de Kirchberg um, at the Boulevard Konrad Adenauer. Um, well, I think also if we look at that particular development, as said, well, success story, read the works of Karen Alter and other political scientists, and they will be, well, really astounded still by what the ECJ managed to pull off. Um, if you look elsewhere, um, if you look at maybe comparable regional courts um, with a, a general jurisdiction, then um, there is no other type of court which has been around for an equal number of years and has been so much thriving as the ECJ has been. From the regional, we might take a leap to the international front. And we may, for example, compare the International Court of Justice. The ICJ has its, um, you could say, convoluted, its defective jurisdiction regime, which has been holding it back for quite some time. Um, and you could say also in comparison, if you would be willing to put the ECJ um, next to the ICJ, then you could say, well, in uh, comparison, all too frequently, the ICJ, the International Court, has all too frequently experienced wholly fundamental compliance problems. Um, its constituency has not been willing enough to, to play along compared to the ECJ. So in that comparison, the ECJ definitely fares much better. Contrast, moreover, the recent backlash against the dispute settlement body of the World Trade Organization. In particular, of course, the appellate body and all the suffering which has, has undergone um, so far, um, to which, well, the end is still not uh, entirely in sight. Um, again, in comparison, you would say, well, here the ECJ here has a, a much more um, strong and proud track record. Also consider the various withdrawals from the Rome Statute. Um, so the Statute of the International Criminal Court. Um, or also compare the widespread reluctance to cooperate with the International Criminal Court, even from those who are party to the Rome Statute. Um, maybe again here the juxtaposing is not entirely fair. The international level is different in many other ways as well, but at least here court-wise in terms of judiciary, I think here the contrast is quite um, striking. Um, as regards the European Court of Justice, the remarkable fact is not only the fact that it's survived for almost seven decades now, um, I think the remarkable fact is also that it is functioning so very well. Um, it commands a certain respect, it um, commands a respect which may perhaps even be called unique. Um, so in that sense here indeed also the idea of a success story, what people have been writing, those people who have been marveling, um, they haven't been myopic. It's not a kind of illusion, Fata Morgana, which might uh, evaporate um, all too quickly. And yet, and yet, it is a, a common trope that every success story has its darker side. We can move beyond the eulogy um, here. Um, in this respect also, every success story has its darker side. The ECJ is not likely to be any different. It's not likely to be intrinsically different. It's not likely to be, let's say, the, the black swan in the lake. Um, so there's here also another side which uh, needs to be told. And to my mind, indeed, here too, there's a collection of shortcomings that may be brought to the fore. There's a specific portrait which I um, chose to highlight in my paper and um, which to my mind have not been receiving the academic attention they are due. To begin with, and I'll elaborate on each of them uh, later on, um, there's the, the idea of what you could call confined authority. Um, there's this particular tension on the vertical axis, if you will, and the tension, as we know, is still unresolved. And the question might well be, well, what particular conclusion should we draw from this? What kind of assessment, what kind of balance sheet can we um, here um, compile? 
Um, there's the unabated vulnerability still today of the institution. If you look at the judicial selection and appointment process, there's a lot more to be said uh, about uh, this. But again, here drawing up ultimately the balance sheet, I think here this kind of vulnerability still deserves to be flagged and has not yet uh, been uh, sufficiently flagged so far. Looking at the output of the court, again, a bit of a, a familiar tale here, but still one here which uh, can be combined with the previous. Uh, the quality issue um, is not something purely of the past. It's still something, you could say, a particular persistent flaw, which we can still look at uh, from a bit of a, a meta level, you could say. And that's something also which I've attempted to do um, in um, my work. Um, there's then, lastly, something brewing, you could say, from within the institution, which you might, well, somewhat cheekily perhaps refer to as Cain and Abel syndrome. I will um, again elaborate on this uh, further. But a certain tension, a certain agitation, which, um, well, if you haven't been living under a stone, something which we cannot be blind to, and which we also should not be blind to, at least here, if we have the, the future, um, also the proper further development, if we have a particular positive outlook, which we also would like to contribute to, then this is something to be um, really um, not overlooked um, and something to be addressed as such. Um, these items, to be sure, they're not entirely unknown, but you could say, well, so far, the highlighted, the, the A, the B, the C, and the D, these aspects have never been combined. So um, as far as I know, this will be the first time that these elements have been brought together under a common heading and are scrutinized in an interlinked fashion. So that's basically here the, the setup, um, you could say the, the roadmap also of this particular talk and hopefully also the eventual publication. So what we're going to be walking through to paraphrase C.S. Lewis, um, you could say these are the shadow lands from the court's past, but also here and um, the shadow lands which persist up to the present. Um, yet, uh, with some effort, with some attention, they could perhaps, the shadows could perhaps still be cast away for the future. There's first of all, what I've decided to label as the situation of confined authority. Um, and well, this, this disposition, maybe the two words don't immediately make much sense, but here just to um, add immediately, um, well, you have this, you could call it a relentless tug of war between the court and its interlocutors, to borrow the famous term from Joseph uh, Weiler. Um, they come in various shapes and sizes, but mostly, of course, we're talking about the national court. And here the courts um, at the national level over the past uh, decades here, um, well, there's, you could say, this, this fractions, fractions relationship, um, the picture is not entirely rosy. Um, so this is adversarialism, you could say, um, between the ECJ, the European court vis-a-vis -vis the national court. Um, and well, I should perhaps also add, um, not all national courts, um, some have been rather more diligent and rather more obedient. But of course, you could say you also have the, the rank and file in the, in the member states, maybe also those courts which preferably you wouldn't pick a fight with. And well, uh, what do you know, especially with those particular courts, um, there, well, the, the battle is on and the battle has been on for quite some time. Um, I here obviously refer to the German Bundesverfassungsgericht, um, whereby the main dynamics are undoubtedly familiar to most observers. You have this familiar narrative where we start way back with the, the Zolanger jurisprudence. We move on to the Maastricht era. And then, of course, we had the Lisbon Urteil to add um, insult to injury. And now you might well think, well, these are mainly the souvenirs from a, a bygone era. Well, um, mind you, they are not. Um, so we have seen most recently the flare up in the vice uh, Zaga on the legality of the public sector purchasing program of the European Central Bank. Um, and not just that, of course, already the, you could say the political tension which that caused, but more particularly to our topic, the concomitant ECJ judgment, which the German Bundesverfassungsgericht declared to be ultra virus. Um, that actually made headlines uh, across Europe and maybe only with that also a lay audience suddenly became aware 
of what had been going on for much longer. Um, moreover, as many EU lawyers here will know, we've seen many other barks turning into a bite, you might say. Um, there's been infamously the Czech Constitutional Court a few years ago, um, also repudiating the supremacy of EU law in the Slovak pensions uh, case law or the Lantova judgment um, that was the uh, main focus of attention there. Um, we've had, of course, also something rotten in the state of Denmark, um, if you allow me. Um, there's the Danish Supreme Court with its Ayers um, judgment, which, well, again here made clear that um, despite also an earlier judgment from quite some time ago, where at least the Danish Supreme Court was willing to agree to the conclusion of the, the Maastricht Treaty with a couple of uh, caveats, uh, well, still also many years later, even in Denmark, um, that earlier reticence here has turned into uh, full-blown resistance. Um, only slightly less fractious are the relations of the ECJ with the Italian Corte Costituzionale, um, as ever evident from the uh, Tarico saga um, from, again, also a fairly recent date. Um, now, for those who already are aware of the whole picture, then we here shouldn't forget the French judiciary, even if there, of course, perhaps right now, there's not much trouble brewing. Um, the French judiciary has not proven itself to be much more amenable um, in its case law on the direct effect of directives inter alia. Um, so in other member states also, a certain silence right now might not necessarily mean everything. And compare also a remark by Michal Bobek a few years ago um, about this perennial uncertainty we have with regard to the lack of references under Article 267. Um, so you could say as part of the unknown unknowns, um, you have this assumed lack of references. There's a bit of a, a well, a black hole here. Um, we are, well, believing or willing to believe here that obedience is the name of the game, but still quite a number of uh, courts might still be all too often interpreting EU law in accordance with their own preference. So this presumption of a, a habit of obedience from those courts from which we hear little or nothing, um, to then assume that there's a prevailing willingness to collaborate and the prevailing willingness to subordinate oneself to the authority from Luxembourg, well, um, that's a, a risky one. It's a bit of a daring, maybe also premature, um, even precocious kind of uh, statement. Um, there, of course, there's an abundant literature on this. We, um, again, most of us here will be aware of the whole um, legal pluralism debate, uh, which has been raging for more than a decade, and all kinds of alternative models, um, either the legal pluralism, the constitutional pluralism, um, contrapunctual law, as someone has uh, labeled it, um, um, e tutti quanti, uh, you could uh, say. Um, we have those particular approaches. There is plenty to be said also academically about the struggle between the national and the supranational. And there's even more that has already been published. Um, but my question here does not so much pertain to uh, that of who is right, um, nor whether we can even presume any kind of hierarchy, um, nor as part of this debate um, of how may these contrasting views be reconciled. If we simply look at the plain facts, um, as also put here, I think it's a plain fact. If you look at the ideology or the original rationale of the ECJ's uh, approach, well, it has clearly been playing for an overriding authority. It has been playing for an absolute supremacy from the early 1960s onwards. You can twist and turn, you can try to reinterpret and reconfigure, but um, well, it's a, a plain fact that this, at least in itself, um, this kind of superiority was part and parcel of the messages which the court was trying to sell. And just as much a plain fact is that the court has not succeeded in acquiring such an authority and acquiring such a supremacy as an absolute overlord, um, as the true hierarchical master. Um, it failed to convince a selection of interlocutors in the past, and more importantly, it's still failing to do so in the present. And that includes at least one of the two senates of the Bundesverfassungsgericht, even if one of the two does seem to be a bit more sympathetic nowadays compared to the other. Moreover, 
that selection of defined interlocutors may even be growing. If we here also uh, draw up uh, the score from the last 10 years, then, well, you might say here it's a slightly more harrowing situation, even compared to a couple of decades ago. Um, and well, then maybe we could and perhaps even should wonder, to paraphrase John Cleese in his um, magnificent role as Basil Fawlty, um, quite coincidentally, actually, in the Fawlty Towers episode about the Germans, um, who started the bloody war anyway? Um, so where was the origin here? Um, I would reckon the court of justice itself. And just a bit of a thought experiment. Um, imagine that we would be able to rewind um, all the way back to the 1960s. Then perhaps there's something to be said for a more gentle approach from the European court of justice. Um, meaning taking a bit more time and make, taking a bit more effort to avoid upsetting its national counterparts, upsetting like it did uh, in judgments such as Van Gogh and Delos, Costa, Costa Enel, and also the dairy products case, which um, William Phelan has deservedly drawn to our attention. If the court had proceeded in that particular manner, that perhaps could have prevented the ongoing and still unresolved tussle, as well as even the need to conjure up those sophisticated paradigms of legal pluralism and the like, um, paradigms which actually do not manage to even reconcile the underlying conflict in normative terms anyway. So our world would definitely have looked different. After all this time, I think also the ramifications of this tug of war are clear enough, and these should also be factored in also by us in the legal realm, um, because they also stretch out to the political and to the economical. Um, if you look at how politicians hold their breath and how the stock markets hold their breath whenever a new judgment from the Kirchberg or from Karlsruhe is imminent, well, you can wonder, you could say, well, these are surely not the signs of the rude health of any given polity. One might argue, of course, it's a system with checks and balances, and it's always likely to inspire uh, at least a certain back and forth, but I would think, well, here at least the situation is at least slightly worse. Next, there's still something askew with regard to the judicial selection and appointment process. And make no mistake, much has improved with the entry into force of the Lisbon Treaty. We now have this scrutiny panel established in accordance with Article 255 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. And well, that panel, originally known as the Sauvet panel, and uh, nowadays are chaired by someone else um, that has at least that system also of Article 255 of the TFU has a lot going for it. That's something which I also have duly acknowledged in a handful of academic analysis myself. myself. Um, but still, we have not entered the Garden of Eden just yet. Um, there are some matters that already seemed questionable at the dawn of European integration and which continue to be unaddressed today. And even some of these may even have been made worse. These particular features continue to leave the court and its members vulnerable. Um, this matter is explored in further detail in my uh, paper. Time is too short, I should say, to do the issue justice entirely. But let me relatively briefly point to uh, a couple of bottlenecks. If we here look at the past, then we may look back not in anger, but in bemusement at a traditional easygoing approach, you could say, um, of the representatives of the member states. Uh, you could say the, the, the happy acceptance of the member states at the time um, with that system whereby basically they said who would be the next members of the Court of Justice. Well, they were happy to accept the risk that they were appointing people who lacked the right skills. And well, that kind of happy-go-lucky approach is indeed in itself remarkable. We know from the oral history, and actually some who have dared to put it in print, that several mistakes were made. So at least here, um, people should have realized that at least back then, the system as it was, wasn't entirely fit for purpose. Now here still today, there appears to be a, a black hole, a, a lacuna, if you will, um, as well, we have those appointment decisions which are ultimately still made by the representatives of the member states. And by the likes of it, 
these decisions cannot be judicially reviewed. If we are at least to take seriously last year's ruling uh, of the general court, still part also of an ongoing saga. Uh, again, some viewers will be aware, uh, th these are the cases initiated by Ms. Eleanor Sharpson. Um, and what did we see so far? Well, uh, declining of jurisdiction as well, apparently the member states act in some kind of um, peculiar legal void whenever they take their collective decisions to install a judge or install an advocate general, um, as they did with A.G. Rantos, uh, who took the place of Ms. Sharpston. Now, this is all the more remarkable that position taken by the general court um, in the last installment in the saga, since, well, we know that the nominations are prepared actually by the Committee of Permanent Representatives. Um, they do here have a particular responsibility. And what we are actually talking about is a rubber stamping of those particular nominations in also the margins of a council meeting. So we do have that scrutiny panel and that still has a particular influence, but it stands still channeled through the machinery, you could say, the machinery of EU law. So the outcome, which we're supposed to, to here take for granted is, well, slightly odd. That's at least the, the, the euphemism which one could apply here. Um, we have some other issues here, which you could say here exacerbate the, the problematic. Um, there is, for example, the issue of transparency. Um, no insight is provided into the files of the candidates, either accepted or rejected. And that's also here a practice against which also uh, inter alia Alberto Alemano and uh, his good lobby campaign have justifiably railed. We have um, the scrutiny panel, which, um, well, established on the basis of Article 255 of the TFEU, it exerts a phenomenal technocratic power here, you could say, the triumph of um, technoc techno technocracy. And, um, well, uh, against that, you could say, well, here, um, there should be a certain counterweight, at least an increased measure of democratic oversight would be desirable. And well, that counterweight is um, absent. The European Council could have played there a particular role, but it has been fobbed off in that 255 system with the right to nominate just one panel member. Conversely, also here with regard to that, that risk, that problem of uh, technocracy, um, the panel itself has decided to creatively expand on the official appointment criteria. And while that might be still be fine, uh, if at least also here this leads to, you could say a greater measure of output legitimacy, but gender considerations would perhaps be fairly welcome. Yet gender considerations remain curiously absent. And there again, some kind of doubt could be expressed on whether or not the current system is indeed fit um, for purpose. Um, coupled with this, by the way, of course, the perennial doubts with regard to the term of office of the appointees, still the classic renewable six years, which poses risks for judicial independence. And well, if you don't follow that line, then at least it poses risks for the appearance of judicial independence. And now granted, of course, um, the retort might well be the her and der Verträge, the member state governments should be blamed for this particular setup, but still neither they nor the court has been have been swayed to adjust the legal architecture on these counts in any meaningful way. Third, on a similar note, um, although much has changed through the years, still today, the quality of the case law leaves something to be desired. Um, many listeners will be aware of how it all began in the French tradition and the classic French magisterial style um, we had then, well, the redundancy, you could say, of the attendu que, or the considering that uh, formula in those um, early judgments. And, well, um, remarkably, actually, they went down quite well, at least in certain corners. So remarkably, here we could say, despite the frictions with the member state courts discussed a moment ago, it is clear that the court's pronouncements have managed to obtain a considerable following. Um, they have obtained a considerable adherence. This then, actually, despite the fact that if you look at them, those judgments from the first decades textually and linguistically, they have more than once left something to be desired. 
Um, but still, well, they went down well, at least in certain corners, which, well, um, then begs for an explanation. Probably still there were other factors at play than the pure persuasiveness of the solutions that the court came up with. And here, consider especially the judicial empowerment thesis of Karen Alter, um, as collaborated also by other political scientists. So here the idea that this opportunity for national courts to increase their own standing by linking up with the ECJ, thereby, if need be, ignoring their superiors, or at least circumventing their superiors, well, that might, that might be the best um, explanation for how indeed those ECJ judgments incited compliance um, beyond their actual persuasiveness. So here, arguably, the court could afford to shy away from delivering perfect communications. Make no mistake, matters did improve gradually. And um, a lot of the earlier criticism has become less apposite. If you look at today's judgments, well, the coherence and the intelligibility are now generally much better in order. Um, in my paper, I endeavor to provide a bit of a meta-analysis here of the current quality of the case law. And once more, there's a rich literature on this, which focuses on a number of different aspects. Um, we can talk about the interpretation techniques applied. We can talk about the solidity of the actual arguments and the reasoning employed. Um, we can talk about the consistency. And then, well, with regard to consistency, um, either within the particular judgment or in between different judgments. And if you engage in such an analysis, then what you will notice is that still there's plenty of room for criticism. And that criticism can still be found in a plethora of case notes. And again, well, you could say here, extrapolating it further is something from which perhaps many still uh, shy away from. Um, but well, justifiably, such a broader criticism can still be made where also you bring those different elements together. And then maybe particularly also, we see that consistency issue um, also in certain series of cases where it's a bit of a, a zigzag approach on more than one particular subject matter. Um, so the problems here are real. And again, the complaints are not merely historical artifacts. And just to prove this, um, on the next slide, I have a fairly recent case, which I would like to put on display for a moment. Um, so that the problems are still real. Um, well, here you have a case from a couple of years ago, and this is the dictum. And mind you, this is even a judgment of the Grand Chamber. So it's one which preferably displays a, a maximum of clarity. Uh, vice versa, of course, it's a known fact that the greater the number of judges involved and with the Grand Chamber, you have 15, well, the more difficult it is to arrive at a polished result. Um, but still, um, by now I hope someone has come close at least to the full stop um, because um, this is uh, quite a, a stretch, perhaps even nauseating to a certain extent. Um, uh, admittedly, of course, it may well be that it's easier to grasp this one if you have a greater familiarity with the overall context of the case. And to those, of course, with a, a greater grasp, uh, enhanced grasp of the EU environmental law is a key, then this might well be a, a cakewalk. But still, personally, um, I fear even the connoisseurs of the subject matter might still struggle with this one. So, Final line on this slide, um, in sum, I cannot help thinking that the court could still do better. And I cannot help thinking that we still have not really progressed sufficiently. You could say the early days, even if perhaps also there the, the message ultimately was clear enough, um, you did have that propaganda campaign of the court itself, um, which Antoine Rouchet has pointed to, where Fagendri Loos needed to be sold and not simply on its uh, quality but um, on its merits itself, um, on itself um, also here, um, well, Van Gendelos as such, as a message of a new legal order, which was supposed to be swallowed without any particular kind of backlash. But again, also the increasing historical evidence does point to actually the backlash, which still could not be avoided. And that obscurity is again, not incidental to just those early rulings. Um, if we take it all the way to the present, then, well, you have that artificial distinction inter alia in the Pringle case, 
between economic and monetary policy, which uh, again, also the specialists are not willing to immediately sign up to. Um, there's been, of course, Alan Dashwood's famous criticism amongst that of many others of the Mangold case and the whole Mangold case law, where perhaps still the final explanation is yet to arrive. Um, there's uh, Neve uh, Nixivna's uh, criticism of the Ruiz Sombrano case, with also uh, her seven questions for seven paragraphs, because we didn't get um, any more. Um, we can compare how Steve Wetherill um, in 2013 did a study on the quality of the internal market jurisprudence, um, criticizing various rulings for providing merely, as he put it, uh, circumloquacious statements of the result rather than supplying proper reasons for arriving at it. Now, arguably, the highest courts should be able to fulfill the highest standards. And in this respect, or so I contend, we may indeed find the output of the ECJ wanting even in the year 2021. Moving on to the next slide, at least the software will play along, yes. Um, we have lastly, um, we have the various tensions and agitations from within the institution. Um, the institution, which of course is formally called the Court of Justice of the European Union nowadays. Mind you, one particular institution, but an institution which is still displaying a particular structure, which is rather more fragmented. We might internally say with a small wink that it suffers from an inescapable multiple personality complex. <clears throat> After all, it's an institution which is composed of several limbs or several branches, um, and even as much as three until the Civil Service Tribunal was disbanded in 2016. For the longest time, there was only one European court. Um, it was only in the late 1980s that plans were developed for the establishment of a court of first instance. Now, of course, late 1980s, that's already quite some time uh, ago. And by now, this second court has quite nicely come of age. And corresponding to the fact that this court of first instance is actually no longer a first instance court, we have the Lisbon Treaty, which rightly amended its name to the General Court. Now, on the inside, what may be observed here in the present day and age is a distinct rivalry between the superior branch, the ECJ, with its sibling, the inferior branch, which is the GC. Maybe rivalry is a bit too strong a term, um, but definitely um, you could say there's a an incompatibilité des humeurs between the two. Um, there is here um, a particular setup which uh, has produced tangible confrontations in recent years. Now, rewinding first, um, we could go back to the very beginning and wonder, well, where is here the original sin, the, the root of the problem? Well, it's known again, in part uh, already through the oral uh, history, um, the oral tradition um, that at least here the judges in the Court of Justice, they tend to be a bit less collegial. And that's a phenomenon already from the early 1990s. And even some of them tend to look down upon those in the general court. However, shocking that might uh, sound. Um, but let me put it in slightly more neutral terms. Um, unsurprisingly, the appointments to the ECJ carried the maximum prestige. And still today, the appointments to the ECJ do carry the maximum prestige. Um, we also have had, from the early beginning, the appeal system. And there are multiple cases where the ECJ, on appeal, overruled the general court. And not just overruled the general court, but occasionally also in a rather caustic and uh, a rather too assertive fashion. Take one infamous illustration the brushing aside of the GC's Diego Quere solution by the ECJ in the UPA case, the Union de Pequenos Agricultores. Um, well, in that particular case, um, you had there that particular quashing, wherewith here the conditions for starting an action for annulment under the fourth paragraph of Article 263 TFEU by natural and legal persons would not be judicially widened. 
going against even the advice of A.G. Jacobs, of course, here uh, arguing for a test of substantive adverse effect. Consider also the Cardi saga, uh, wherein the ECJ displayed a completely different take on the hierarchy of norms in the European legal order, um, as opposed to the view of the general court. The ECJ displaying a completely different take also on the relationship of EU law vis-a-vis -vis international law. Again, there are similar um, division. A recent similar move would be observed in Bank Reva Kageran. Um, to those familiar with the case law, uh, there um, you have this situation within the realm of the foreign the common foreign security policy. Um, does there exist a regime for liability of the European Union itself? Well, here the ECJ owned up to the existence of such a regime for acts adopted within the common foreign and security policy. Whereas this had previously been strenuously denied by the general court. Now you might say, of course, here such overruling is itself also a matter of course in any multi-tiered jurisdiction. And if you look also elsewhere in other strings of uh, rulings, then take for example, competition law, there are numerous cases where the ECJ has repeatedly delivered a verdict on the assessments of the general court um, many of those verdicts are quite quite damning, but at the same time, they are still quite plausible, especially the way in which also the GC went about its economic assessments. Well, you could dare say here the overruling in itself was justified as such. So in that sense, still here, um, nothing to be too worried about. Um, moreover, one should say it's neither this type of overruling, nor maybe that prevalence prevalent sense of superiority at the ECJ, which really leads immediately to outright clashes. And you can also here really question whether it causes permanent damage, which may in turn result in a progressive weakening of the coherence of the case law. Um, well, despite all that, the relationship between the two is ostensibly still quite an uncomfortable one. This discomfort extends as much to the managerial sphere whereby the ECJ is firmly in the hot seat and the members of the GC in the relevant fora are heavily outnumbered. In the taking of the day-to-day -day administrative decisions, you could say here their voice carries insufficient weight. Adding insult to injury, the GC does not even dispose of its own resources. Adding further insult to injury, its president of the GC is not authorized to speak externally not even for expressing the views of merely its own particular branch, the general court. Matters came to a head a few years ago when the political choice was made to double the number of judges at the general court with the outright support of the president of the ECJ, then still Vasilios Skouris. This sparked a sequence of confrontations inter alia due to the judges of the general court interacting illegally with members of the European parliament we had a, a leaked chastising letter by the GC president, uh, Mark Yeager, and we had a number of critical publications from the side of retiring GC member, Renaud de Hoes. There are signs, meanwhile, that a new wind has started to blow ever since the current ECJ president, Kuhn Lenaerts, took up office. And Lenaerts, as some might be aware, previously served at the court of first instance, and that's something at least which is bound to further the mutual understanding. He has a, a good rapport um, with the new general court president, Mr. Mark van der Woude, and um, maybe also that rapport is likely to be better because they can both communicate in their native language. And um, I will extol uh, of the virtues and the beauty of the Dutch language also uh, in a different seminar. Um, nevertheless, the last word has not yet been said on how the GC was against its will turned into a deliberative assembly. I think it's difficult to put a different name on it. 54 judges um, against the will of the GC uh, as such. Um, there's not yet a final word on whether that happened with truly good cause. There's not yet the final word on whether that reform has been implemented truly effectively. And there's a lot of uh, dubious PR going on about that um, right now. There is not yet the final word on whether or not this setup should become the permanent status quo. So there are also plenty of potential for further escalation. For sure, the pressures between the two branches have dropped 
far below the boiling point, you could say, at least the boiling point um, those uh, pressures reached under President Skouris. But in organizational terms, at least, we may, as said, still spot a series of mismatches through which the GC is arguably kept too firmly under the thumb of the ECJ. Now then, drawing up a, a balance sheet and borrowing perhaps first from Eric Stein and uh, Federico Mancini, what emerges is, of course, the picture of a judiciary, which, um, well, in terms of, of mission complete or mission incomplete, you would say perhaps it's still the former rather than the latter. Um, as Stein and Mancini have put it, the, this judiciary has single-handedly crafted a veritable constitution for Europe. There are, however, cracks in the edifice. As discussed, the ties maintained with national courts could have been better in the past. If the ECJ had spread its own original sins a bit more thinly in the foundational epoch, then, well, these ties could have been wholly different. And at least also here, these ties must improve further into the future if there is to be a future um, at all. The selection and appointment system has certainly improved, but it cannot be qualified as flawless. I hope you will accept at least here my evidence to the contrary. The same goes for the quality of the case law and the same goes for the interplay between the ECJ and the GC. Uh, the latter might actually even have taken a turn for the worse, or the worst might still be yet to come. Only time will tell whether these cracks, whether these fault lines will be mended, or whether they will stay in our sights for a while longer. And well, uh, perhaps other institutional actors are called upon, perhaps other institutional actors may be responsible to also apply the glue to the cracks. At least in EU law scholarship, we could do with a slightly greater recognition that these cracks actually exist, and not just that they actually exist, but that they may even persist, at least if left unaddressed. So there's my conclusion, a conclusion which I dare to put in black and white, and therewith I draw to a close. I thank you very much for your patience, and I thank you for having me. I very much look forward to any questions and further discussion.